Uh, two years ago, this week, I was tested for the HIV, and the results indicated that I, indeed I was uh, positive, HIV positive. I entered into an understanding of that information based on a lot of research and reading and understanding, indeed teaching and lecturing that I'd already done on the subject of HIV infection. Nevertheless, when one encounters that kind of information on one's own, I have since learned in my own instances and in, in uh, the instances of others that we react in the only ways that we know how to react. Now that seems like a um, kind of a redundant thing to say, but uh, the point I'm making is that, uh, as simple as, as it may sound, we only do what we know to do. And my background was was one at that time of a great deal of information and understanding technically of, of uh, the HIV, but I had not assimilated that information into my own existence, into my own life, to the extent that I could draw on that for, for comfort, for example, or for understanding enough to allay any kind of fears that I had. Strangely enough, and I say strangely because I'm talking about what I would suspect persons would expect, that I did not uh, fear death. I did not, that was not my first thought, I'm going to die. I, my first thought was, what's going to happen to my children, what is going to happen to my job, uh, what is going to happen to a lot of the people I believed at that time were in some way dependent on me. <clears throat> it occurred to me then, and that's the point that I'm illustrating, was that that's all that I knew to do, that's all I knew to think, that's all I knew to say. I have already encountered not personally, but uh, intellectually encountered and dealt with death and dying. I know too much about it to take what might be called a stereotypical, general kind of attitude about that through fear or panic or whatever might have been the case. I did, however, believe that I experienced panic eventually, and the panic was still related to what am I going to do about the loose ends in my life? I have people who are dependent on me, both professionally and socially, so what am I going to do? How am I going to resolve that? How am I going to deal with that? Noticing, I think now, that the focus was on I, 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 that it was my responsibility and I'm the one who had to take charge of that and deal with that. Rightly or wrongly, that's what I felt at the time. Uh, the, the panic that I mentioned, and I really mean panic behavior, occurred after I realized not that I was diagnosed with HIV, but that my uh, T4 lymphocyte count was as low as it was at that time. In other words, I had apparently been infected for quite some time, and the virus had been active for quite some time undetected. Uh, with a lymphocyte count so low, I realized that the chances of immediate infection and, and death were pretty imminent, I believed so. That was two years ago at the time. I still haven't been sick from the infection, but uh, I didn't obviously know what was coming. Uh, what I only knew was what I had read and knew intellectually could occur. So I called a support group of friends immediately who came to my home and I told them my fears and I was in a real panic state, lots of sobbing, uh, wringing of hands, uh, not knowing which way to turn, not knowing what to do. Uh, 
that is when I believe, in my case, what I would call the grief process began. I don't think it's necessary for any of us, I suppose, to pinpoint when it begins and what happens and what those steps and stages are, but it was, if nothing else, important for me to look back and understand this is where I began to face or try to face where I was, uh, physically, where I was emotionally, psychologically, whatever else we want to apply to that. That's about a period of three months from the time that I found I was infected until I got this count and realized what I believed to be my state of health at the time, or lack of health. My first concern was my children, who was going to take care of them, and we're, we're talking about really men rather than children. Uh, they're certainly men now, they were just leaving adolescence at that time, and I still felt responsible, you know, what is going to happen to them. I still have a myriad of things I need to teach them as a, as a parent. I have a, a, a things I want to show them that I haven't done. It's those kinds of things that crosses one's mind sometimes in this kind of uh, situation. So, uh, the, the comfort that I received was almost immediate because the support group that I surrounded myself with and, and a, a kind of thing I think that, that one should do in this kind of situation is find those persons who can provide you the, the comfort that you need in whatever form that is, whether it's professional or what. Does not make any difference? I knew that and I had arranged for that and, and uh, it worked very, very well. And what I, what I received was uh, an immediate means to do all of that. Get your papers together, get your, get your insurance together, get your, your house in order. If that's what's bothering you, that's easy to deal with. And I did that in a matter of days, not weeks. In just a matter of days, I dealt with that. And I have not panicked since, in two years' time. Not panicked. I've had fear, but I've not panicked. Not been, and I use the word panic to mean a, a serious stage of anxiety that's almost immobilizing. And I didn't, I have not had that problem since then. Clinically, I step back and look at that and think that is so strange. That is so that is so weird. That is so out of the unexpected. And then, of course, I'm making a judgmental statement about myself in there. I don't think I would have expected me to behave that way. I would have expected me to do what I expect is a normal thing to do, and that is, oh my gosh, I'm going to die, well, now what do I do? And I have still, I don't do that. I, that's just not I. I don't feel that way about it. Where did I learn that? Where did that come from? Why do I not feel that way? I remember when I was Mm, like nine or ten years old, my parents worked, and one of the biggest uh, thrills of my life here in, here in this city uh, we lived was for me to go to work with one of them. I was an only child. I, I, I didn't know that world very well in either case. And so one day I was, I was for some reason, went to work with my mother, who was a, a secretary for an oil man. And... Uh, uh, she and my aunt were the only employees of this particular gentleman. And so I was with people I knew and had spent the day there. And this gentleman was out of the office because he had uh, suffered a severe heart attack. And he was in the intensive care unit. And I remember hearing my mother and my aunt talking about his fear of death. And as an example, she told him, and this is almost uh, verbatim because I'll, uh, I'll never forget this, even my John is not afraid to die. And I thought about that, and I'd, uh, only when she said it, and I couldn't understand how did she know that. And then it dawned on me that because of my religious upbringing, even at the age of 10, 
when death was an unrealistic thing to me, I had been taught enough directly in my church upbringing that death was not something to be feared, that it was a transitional step. This was, you understand, prior, many, many years prior to any uh, uh, psychological understanding that we had had or any research that had been done on that subject. It was purely a religious thing. I've never forgotten that, and I always thought that was true, and I thought it was true at the time. Uh, then someone drew to my attention the, uh, a few years ago when I was doing volunteer work with the I Can Cope program. Uh, that there is a difference between fear of death and what it holds afterwards and the fear of dying or the dying process. Later, when I encountered um, AIDS as a disease and an epidemic and pandemic, as a matter of fact, and I was traveling and learning everything I could about it as a volunteer in that particular area, I found that a lot of, of men and women who were eventually diagnosed early on, like in the uh, early 80s, in 1981 and 82, uh, were experiencing enough fear about the dying process that they were doing away with themselves, for example. A lot of that initially. That's because the opportunistic diseases were pretty horrendous, and persons were, were dying slow and agonizing deaths, and not attempting to justify suicide in any way, it's understandable where their fear occurred. I searched for that, once again, a victim of my own training, I searched for that in myself, literally, you know, where is your fear of dying, and I just don't have it. I just don't have it. Uh, whether that is ignorance, you've never watched anybody die except your mother and father, or you've, uh, you don't know what to expect, and therefore you don't have enough sense to be afraid, are all of these things that you say you believe you really do. I would prefer to believe that the, the uh, latter is true, that I really don't have that problem. I don't have any kind of psychological manifestations of fear. I don't dream about dying. I don't dream about being sick at all, ever. Never have. I don't dream about uh, anything except now that we're changing the subject to dreams, except about my mother and father. I dream about them very frequently. And we visit and do inane things together, uh, undramatic things like ride in a car or uh, pick up leaves in the front yard, things that, that I get up and, and, and laugh about it. What a waste of a dream. If we're going to do something, let's do something bizarre. But I don't dream in bizarre ways. Uh, I suspect, as a side note, that I'm comforting myself with these two people who are no longer living and they, they are comforts to me as an only child, so we sort of spend time together and a dream is a very pleasant kind of thing. It's not sad or... And they don't talk about disease and I don't talk about dying and I don't know, it's just an interesting phenomenon that occurs that I tie in part to my religious beliefs as well. In summary of that particular kind of thing, feeling the need to summarize there, my thoughts at that point, I, I suspect that, um, that those of us who are terminal, to whatever degree and whatever way, and I want to come back to the thought of terminal, are going to find comfort, and by that I mean peace, calmness, serenity, whatever one needs in order to function effectively and, in fact, at the top of one's ability to function. If one is able to tie this crisis, whatever you want to call it, to one's value system, and by that I mean to whatever one ties one's uh, sense of right and wrong and good and bad and, and so forth, those value systems, I believe, developed early in our lives from sources that are varied and give us comfort throughout our lives and give us stability insofar as we have that. Uh, I believe that I have achieved a certain amount of stability because of that long-standing value system developed from religious beliefs. 
I think by way of clarification, I would call myself a, a, a very religious person, a, a um, very actively religious person, and, I, and uh, I would not sell religion necessarily as the thing to do, but the type of thing that gives one comfort. You can find stability and values in other resources. I said I would come back to the idea of terminal. I think after two years of living, and I say that advisedly, two years of living, after diagnosis, good question, is there life after diagnosis? Yes. And what I am discovering is that um, I have no trouble dealing, at least now certainly, no trouble dealing with the fact that, I'm, that I am terminal. But my friends, acquaintances, and persons who know about this have a little trouble with it. Because terminal means, and I'm being a little facetious here, terminal means bedridden, immobilized, uh, IVs in the arm, and uh, oxygen tents. And it dawned on me after a while that those of us who suffer from these kinds of diseases, and I'm saying that deliberately because I don't really know anything else but HIV infection, that's what I know, so I really can't talk about uh, a person's terminal with other diseases, but I know certainly that persons who are terminal with HIV infection generally, who are in the earlier stages, particularly of HIV infection, are aware of the terminal condition of their disease, but are not sick, and it doesn't communicate well. I believe, and this is, this is, this is I speaking only, I believe that in all stages of our life, wherever we happen to be, that we need personally, individually, confirmation of who we are. Confirmation of what is happening to us, confirmation of where we're going, whatever, about us. We need confirmation, that's why we're social people, social beings. And I sometimes find it difficult to get confirmation of my terminal illness from my friends, probably for many reasons, but not the least of which, I think, is because those of us with HIV infection, until we get sick, are still terminal, but not sick. And it's an interesting phenomenon to this disease. I think it's probably similar in other diseases as well. I have known persons who tell me I have cancer and they don't look sick, they don't look ill. I remember my mother being that way. So I'm sure it applies. But in this sense, we're talking about, or I'm talking about, the concept of being terminal, being infected with a disease, in this case a virus, from which no one has recovered, and therefore what is terminal. I find myself, on occasion, fantasizing about how much easier it would be if I were immobilized, if I were very sick. And I often wonder now, is that tempting to persons who find that the only way they can get sympathy, which they don't need but want, our empathy, our care, our concern, is to hurry along the, the debilitating part of the disease. That's speculation. I didn't know if that's the case. That thought has crossed my mind, how much easier it would be if I were wheelchair-bound, if I were bed-bound, if I were very, very ill. Easier in what respect? Easier in the sense that um, uh, persons would obviously know that I was indeed sick and indeed terminal. Now, what I want them to do, I haven't quite figured out yet. You know, what I want them to say, feel, whatever. But it's certainly self-oriented, that kind of feeling. And generally, I dismiss that because some part of me, and I hope a bigger part of me, says, you don't want to be sick, you don't want to be immobilized, not really, along the way. But I thought that was an interesting feeling, that I had an interesting reaction.
Another thing that occurs to me is that I don't remember ever denying this disease, and, and uh, part of it was an expectation that when I went for, to be tested, I expected it to be positive. Part of it's involved with um, denial. When you know so much about it and can recognize it in others, perhaps you, you, you're, you know too much to deal with it in a sense that you would experience that yourself. So I constantly check myself, maybe, too. And in fact, I do that, about are you denying this disease? My encounter with denial was not so much in the behavior, but finally asking myself, well, so what? So what if I do deny that? What is wrong with that? What does that do uh, along the way? And I don't, think I, I don't think I ever thought about that in all the years of my teaching about the, the phenomenon of denial that I ever that I ever thought that it was uh, what it was wrong with it I never encountered that and I used the phrase wrong with it because obviously denial can be a helpful feeling at times it, it gives me a chance to put it aside until I can uh, uh, deal with it in, a, in an effective way whatever that means for the individual but consistent denial prevents me from growing. And by that I mean I really believe not philosophically, not spiritually, but realistically that we have an opportunity to grow until we die. And, and as the old man said, I ain't dead yet. So I don't want to deny myself the growth of which I feel is a significant part of my life or anybody else's. So I think denial was not something I wanted to do consciously because it denies growth. And uh, I have too great of an opportunity, quite frankly, quite clinically, in this situation to uh, grow. It's too great. It's, an, it's a new experience. It's uh, not everybody gets to do that kind of thing. So, from whatever route, I don't remember dealing with that. What I do remember dealing with, and I really want to share, is a great deal of deep felt and eventually manifest anger. That surprised me. I, anger is not a particular part of my personality or was not a part of my personality. I did not come from an anger-filled home and I, and I did not learn how to be angry. I'm not so sure I'm alone in that kind of thing. There are plenty of persons who did not learn how to be angry. And I think that's obviously something we, we learn. Uh, therefore, when I encountered the, the feelings of anger, I didn't know what to do. And how it began then to manifest itself was in uh, sudden outbursts and uncontrollable uh, um, hitting, so to speak, figuratively at persons or whomever happened to be around. Probably a classical reaction to repressed anger is what I was dealing with, not knowing how to deal with it. It, it so imbued my life that I believe that I experienced a personality change so that no matter what was said to me by whom I've had an angry reaction to it, sometimes overt, most of the times covert. But I still lived with this kind of uh, turmoil of rage in my, in my being, in my system. And I didn't recognize it. I didn't see it. I didn't realize it was occurring. Until the feedback I began to receive from my friends or from my students or from uh, my family indicated that I was different, that I was uh, angry. And once that came to my attention, it was, once again, because of what I knew, easy for me to say, you're angry because of the unfairness of this disease. And that gave me then an opportunity to deal with it, to talk about it, to, uh, to uh, realize it's okay, to give myself permission to be angry, to uh, whatever we want to say about it. And then as soon as I got a handle on it, it began to d go away. I'm not so sure I, int I, I wanted it to go away. I, didn't, I don't think I approached it that way. I just wanted to understand it. 
and it began to go away. Periodically it returns, but uh, not in the way that it did then, and that's been six months ago, perhaps, that I was in this period of feeling that way. Um, after that time, after that kind of a, uh, initial reaction, I began to move into a very intellectual approach to an understanding of what was happening to me. Uh, who am I and what's going to occur? Because of my background also as a, as a person who is also, or in one way or another, professionally or otherwise involved in theater, I laughingly found myself thinking that my death would be in a dramatic way propped on pillows in a large bed with family and friends standing around and uh, I dramatically giving words of wisdom and humbleness, dying quietly and with great testimony to, to my friends on what a uh, brave person that I am. And now I look back and laugh. That, that could happen, but that's probably not who I am. Because when I, get, when I get sick, I'm more likely to take a fetal position and want to be taken care of. And that's my point. Someone says in, in the literature, and, and I've read it again and again in various things I've read on this subject, and I've read a lot, and that's the subject of death and die, that we die as we live. Once again, it's that you do what you know to do. You don't create something different. Well, to die in a dramatic fashion that would work well on television or the stage is not me. What I do when I'm, when I'm ill or whatever is to seek uh, help. Mommy and Daddy take care of me. And I've decided that uh, maybe that's okay and that I'll just uh, uh, not necessarily orchestrate that, but allow that to occur and not let it w worry me or bother me. That uh, uh, there are people who can take care of me professionally and do that professionally, and there are friends who are willing to hold my hand, and, and that's fine. Uh, I found that a startling realization because I wanted to have this kind of dramatic thing along the way. I'm, I'm much more comfortable with being me. Uh, I have to say, as a side note in relationship to that, that I don't have a lot to go on in terms of being sick. I'm not a terribly unhealthy person, but I haven't been sick much in my life at all. I still haven't been very sick. Um, even though my immune system is very, very compromised at this point in time, I haven't been sick. Uh, the sicknesses that I have had have been due to medications that I've taken and not to uh, the, the virus itself along the way. I think one other thing that I would certainly like to talk about, and that is one's attitude. We read a lot nowadays, and uh, there's lots of testimony given to attitude. When someone comes to you and says, uh, I'm sorry to tell you that you have a virus in your system that's going to kill you, sooner or later, it is difficult, I think, for one to say, oh, that's okay. Not only is it difficult, I think it's probably natural for one to react that way initially. So I, I think we do a disservice to persons when we say to them, You're, you, you need to stop that. You need to stop being in grief. You need to uh, stop being upset. You need to stop being panicked. I really believe we do a disservice to persons when we say that kind of thing. Part of our motivation for that, I believe, is because it's much more comfortable to deal with people who are stoic. It's easier to deal with our friends when they don't talk about the fact that they're dying. Uh, it's easier to, to deal with terminal patients when they're brave. But that's also not realistic for even the bravest person. Uh, the attitude, therefore, that I have striven and still strive to deal with is what I believe is a careful balance between hope and realism. 
and I find that that works for me very well. The hope is that this disease is so unpredictable. It is so rift of absolute patterns or any other absolutes. And we live in a time of such rapid medical, relatively speaking, medical developments that there is hope. Counter that all the time. But I also believe that hope can be either realistic or unrealistic and therefore I find it comforting, as contradictory as this may seem, to know the truth, to attempt to understand what is realistic about this. Yes, there are medicines being developed, but how realistic is it that they will be available? And sometimes the answer is real realistic. Sometimes the answer is it's a slow process. So I spend what I think have spent time and find it valuable to spend time and by valuable I mean I get comfort and I get understanding and I get uh, uh, some peace from the realization that I have both hope and a realistic approach. I remember uh, the physician I called to help me when I was diagnosed was a close friend and uh, happened to be, by the grace of God, uh, 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 developing a specialty in the treatment of persons with HIV infection. And I called him on the phone, but one of the things that, that it, that's the main reason I called him, because he was a close friend and had a, a, a specialization or developing one in this area. But also one thing I admire about him is that he is realistic with me. When, when he was treating my parents with their respective uh, terminal situations, he told me the truth as he knew it and when he found it. And I want that. I don't want to play games. I don't want to... I, I, need, I can't act without knowledge. And that, that's what I mean by realism. But the hope, to me, is, uh, is a complex part of, of this thing that I feel, and that hope is, is involved with medicine, that hope is involved with um, positive attitude, that hope is involved with certainly uh, what I believe is my relationship with God, and all of those are equal in my mind and are effective with me. That produces in me an attitude that I think is healthy, meaning I am not, as many feared early on, and would not be tested for that reason, preoccupied with death and dying. I'm not. I'm just not. I don't think about this disease every day. I'm not sick, so that's probably one reason. I'm, I'm a busy person and I'm, you know, by choice, do, do things. I have not detached myself from the world and don't expect to do that anytime soon. I have changed priorities. And I think that's something perhaps I ought to comment on. I and others with whom I have shared this situation, meaning they too are terminal, say, and I have I've met quite a few through volunteer work as well as mutuality, that your priorities in your life change almost immediately. It's a strange phenomenon strange in the sense of how rapidly it occurs that your priorities change when you face the fact that you're dying. The things that to me were so important, and I laugh about them now, but they were so important, you know, that shirt has a spot on it, you can't wear it, uh, uh, people are not going to like your house when they see it because it has got a spot on the carpet underneath the left side of the couch, you know. That was, that was an important part of my existence. In the face of death, I look back and say, who cares? That is not important to me anymore. I might say, incidentally, that that was somewhat tied into the anger that I experienced, why I was angry at the fact that persons were so concerned about things that were totally unimportant. Of course, that was my judgment. 
obviously quite important to those individuals or they wouldn't be feeling the way that they did. But I bypassed that reasoning and went right into anger. Why are you fooling around with that? It's unimportant. People like me are dying and you're going to die someday too because that's one of the conditions of living, you know, et, et cetera. And uh, I remember that being tied in along the way. What kind of priorities did I make? What changes? I think I ought to share this with you. Um, my children and friends took on a significant change in my viewpoint. Uh, I began to measure, probably not clinically, but certainly emotionally and spiritually measure carefully the valuable time that I spent with them and I and am spending with them. And I, I don't think I've ever lost that since I made that kind of flip there. And it was pretty immediate after diagnosis. I begin to sort of answer the question, what's important in your life insofar as it lasts now? What, what, is, what is significant to you? And it didn't take me very long to say my friends and my family are exceptionally significant to me. I was already a deeply and I use that word advisedly, deeply religious person, but I'll just confess that my, my, religious, my religious feelings deepened and have deepened now to a point of almost mysticism. I understand now from reading about that 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 is not a common but not an unusual phenomenon, depending on where a person is in, in their spiritual growth, if that's where they're going at all. Those two things, family and friends, and my religious life, spiritual life, became number one. And ordinarily I had learned that there, you don't need to have a number one and a number two and a number three, that uh, uh, this thing today is number one, but tomorrow it'll be number 20 and, and, and something else is number one. But in this case, since diagnosis, my friends and family and, and my spiritual life are and have remained number one. Therefore, my behavior has reflected that. I have stopped doing certain things, stopped giving time to other things, and given more time to those kinds of things. By my choice and calculation, it was not a, a forced thing. I, I chose those consciously and deliberately. Um, what I didn't do, and what I thought I might do, and, and this is once again part of one's fantasy, I suppose as a child maybe even, but uh, what I thought I would do is that if it's almost like someone says, you know, you only have this many days left to live, what are you going to do? I'm going to do what I've always done. I don't, I, don't, I don't have anything else to do. And I used to fantasize, well, I will, you know, hop in the car and travel around the world, or I'll get on the plane, or I'll... Uh, you know, I'll put on sackcloth and go down on the streets and help the poor, you know, whatever. You live and you die in the same way. You don't do something different, I don't think, and I don't really mean, I don't want to make that a rule. I, I just suspect that we die the way we live because that's what we know to do. Talking about priorities, I began to realize the marvelous uh, uh, values that I had been given, how valuable they were now that I needed them. Uh, my parents had taught me things, my grandparents had taught me things, my teachers in school had taught me things that are, are so valuable to me now. I'm so grateful to have those because that's who I am. That's part of the life that I lead. And, and, uh, I get excited about that, and that's tied up with an attitude. Uh, it's tied up and manifest in an understanding about who I am and where I happen to be. It influenced the choices of the priorities that I made in that, and those changes that I made. I almost make it sound like that prior to this diagnosis I didn't pay much attention to my family and children and, or to my church or whatever, and that's not true. The intensity of those, of those beings in my life and those things in my life changed. The intensity of value of them changed. Uh, 
and it was not so much in that you better get what you can out of them, you better devote what you can to them because you're going to lose them. I don't think I thought of it in that way. I thought more of in terms of what are the valuable things in your life which give you comfort, which uh, are meaningful to you, which in whatever the time is that you have left ought to take your attention. And that's the answer to that kind of thing. Uh, the mundane frustrations of my job, as much as I've loved what I do, are no, longer, are no longer important to me. And I find that the walls did not come tumbling down figuratively when I ignored those things. That not getting stressed, it's not a good thing to do anyway, about what used to be very important didn't make any difference that those things didn't disappear or fall through the cracks or whatever the, uh, the phrase is that's applicable to that situation because I didn't panic over it or worry over it or whatever. Once again, trying to give definition to what it means that my priorities changed on the way. I find in a negative sense there that I am intolerant of persons who are not aware of their mortality. And I one time got this fantasy as an educator that perhaps that's what we ought to do in the beginning in the first grade. And I don't know how you do that effectively, but we need to teach people to face their mortality so that the life that they live can become increasingly better. And by that I mean better from their definition, not from mine. I wish, not, in, not regretfully, but fantasizingly, that I had recognized the fact that uh, as a human being I was mortal a lot earlier in life. But I'm, uh, one of the, the things that I am grateful for now, as ironic as this may sound, is that, the, is that the confrontation of my mortality has given me the greatest appreciation and love for life that I've ever had. So I'm living now for the first time because I'm dying. We all are. We're all dying. And it would be, what's a good word, I think significant to, the, to each individual on a very individual basis to say someday I'm not going to be here and perhaps the value of what I am living ought to be investigated because we all have a value in living. I hope I can make that into a realistic statement and not something that's philosophical, that is, as I tell my class, is worth being embroidered and hung on the wall. It's not that. It's a real feeling. It's a true priority in my life that uh, um, uh, every day, every moment uh, doesn't need to be measured, but uh, it's okay to work to make every day the best that you can make it, or to uh, choose the best choices that you feel you can choose or whatever control that you have. I've given myself a, 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 a mental note here that I didn't think, I knew I wanted to talk about, but I didn't, I had forgotten about it, and I'd like to mention it now, and that is the idea of control. Whenever, whenever I was confronted with the diagnosis, I realized eventually that the grief that I had and was experiencing, and I did experience grief, and still do to a certain extent, that the grief that I was experiencing was indeed over loss, but not so much loss of my life as loss of choices and control. I have spent too much time, as I believe we all do as human beings, particularly as adults, learning to gain control of ourselves. I remember a psychiatrist friend of mine, uh, when he was when he was finishing his internship and getting ready to be fully licensed, uh, I asked him in casually over dinner one evening, along with some other people, why do, why do clients come to you? And he said, all clients come for counseling to get control of their lives. And I thought, well, that's a generic statement and it's absolutely true. Terminal illness can rob me of control. Particularly AIDS is like walking around, and I've heard it said again and again by a number of people, you're walking around with a time bomb that is going to go off, and you don't know how, and you don't know when, 
and you don't know what it's going to do or how devastating it's going to be. Is it one piece of dynamite or is it 30? You know, what is it? You don't know. It's too unpredictable. And therefore, it's so easy for me to say, I have no control over that. And I've lost control over my life. And I did it one time. Find myself saying, I'm not going to plan on Christmas because I won't be there. Or I might not be there. I'm not going to plan on... Uh, I'm not going to get close to my grandchild. I have a grandchild. I'm not going to get close to him because I can't do that to myself. I was feeling pretty sorry for myself at the time. I, might say, I want to say very quickly that that child has been one of the greatest comforts. I mean, that's what grandparenting is all about. I mean, it's been wonderful. And, and I, I am close to, the, to him. How, how can you not be? But I had thought I won't do that because I can't follow through with that. I won't develop any relationships. I won't blah, 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 because I can't be here to do that. I won't make any plans. And then I found out as valuable as it is to really live from day to day and to live in the now, that part of living in the now is having a healthy concern, a healthy contact, a healthy contemplation of what is going to be tomorrow. I can't eat tomorrow until I buy the groceries today, so uh, I think that for me, Living means making plans, things to look forward to, and that's hope, that's exciting. Uh, and so persons will say to me, with all the love in their hearts and well-meaning, you shouldn't plan on doing that because it's going to wear you out or it's going to make you sick. And my point is, unless it inconveniences someone, I'm going to go ahead and plan that. And, and then I, when I get there, if, if it doesn't inconvenience anyone in any way, and I really believe that's important, then I'll do it. Or I won't. Uh, strangely enough, what that helped me to do is not become preoccupied with what are you going to do. And to realize that I have some control. Well, a wise friend said, if you want control, go ahead and do that. You know, uh, you're not dead yet. You you are, are not even sick. You know, so uh, uh, claim the control that you have in your life. You know, that's reasonable and that is given to everyone. And go ahead with that. So I didn't want to pull that pull that out of proportion in any way. But I found I found a lot of comfort. Uh, and this is, I guess, kind of macabre on one hand and humorous on the other. My whole funeral has been completely planned by me. I got great comfort out of that, and even to the extent that I have asked already the persons who are going to participate in that to do so. Uh, probably my theater background, once again, you're going to direct the whole thing. Well, I did. I did direct the whole thing, and that gave me a sense of control. And I'm trying to figure out some way to make sure that I see that, you know, that I can, <laughs> I can watch this thing and, and uh, make sure it comes off all right. And I, I laugh, and my friends and I laugh about that, but uh, seriously, uh, that was valuable. I recommend sitting down and doing those kinds of things in one's life. I, I uh, feel as a person of, of responsibility uh, that uh, I can go ahead and exert that responsibility, you know, uh, follow through with what I believe is my responsible uh, position here. I have a job, and I'm responsible to that. I have a family, and even though they're now adults, I have certain uh, responsible uh, behaviors toward them, I believe, and, and uh, certainly responsible, I feel, toward my friends to be a friend. And I gain control in my life with a disease that doesn't give you much control uh, otherwise by being the friend I'm supposed to be, the father I'm supposed to be, the uh, teacher I'm supposed to be the church member I'm supposed to be, whatever the area of responsibility is. The control issue is an interesting one because uh, it's, it's a very personal kind of thing and uh, some persons have a need, I believe, for more control over their lives than others. And it's part of the way that we're reared or whatever along the way. So I, I say all of that in a kind of relative way to the individual who's experiencing it.
also. I, I thought it occurred to me while I got it perhaps I ought to talk about, uh, and I mentioned it briefly, uh, to talk about preoccupation with uh, one's condition. I just want to make a couple of comments about that. A friend of mine refused to be tested even though he was probably um, in, uh, in, in a high-risk situation through behavior, past behavior, because he didn't want to live with that knowledge. That was a long time ago before we had uh, real good reason for persons to be tested due to treatments that are now available, preventative and prophylactic treatments. He, he particularly said to me, if I find out that I am HIV positive, then I'm going to live with that night and day. I don't want to live that way. I have not seen that. But I, uh, the person about whom I can really talk is, is I, and I have not done that. I mentioned that a while ago. I think once again, what I have finally learned is that I am different than I was. Uh, my body is compromised now. My life is compromised. But I am, in many respects, other things than a dying person. I am a father. I am a, a uh, teacher. I am a, uh, uh, a volunteer. I am an artist. And those parts of my life, in more cases than not, deserve, or I believe, should have my attention more than the fact that one of the roles that I play is a terminal person, and I'm saying all that clinically. Quite frankly, I find being a terminal person, uh, person boring. I don't like that role. That's not as much fun as teaching. That's not as much fun as being a parent. It's not as much fun as, as being a friend. Uh, and I use the word fun there flippantly. Uh, what I really mean is uh, focusing on where I want to be is a matter of choice, and it's not easy to reach that choice, but uh, thank God I've eventually realized that I don't have to live with this every day, and I don't. I think that's probably a much more complex feeling and, and state of being than, than I know about, but uh, for whatever reason, I do believe that anybody, no matter where they are can choose not to live with it every day and to live with what other roles they play in life. Even if they're bedridden, they can still choose not to live with that every day. That's easy for me to say because I've not been bedridden, but I suspect that that is true from what I've observed uh, as well. Why don't we stop for a while and let me get my breath? Yeah, I was thinking you, you do Actions to that. A few uh, a few months ago, uh, a lady wrote about her husband, who was a prominent figure in a Texas city, that he had died in the conspiracy of silence. And I that that didn't have a lot of meaning to me because I didn't really understand what he was going through, and he was a public figure and. We're all public figures in some circle. Uh, by that I mean you may not be very well known in, in, in uh, the city in which you live, except in certain areas like your church or, or your school or whatever, you know, your job, and so forth. But you're public to that person, to that group of persons. I felt like because of my lifetime of activity as a true public figure in, in the area that, that um, this, I needed to be silent about it, that people did not need to know that I needed to protect my children, for example, from uh, ridicule, that I needed to protect myself. I needed to protect the security of my job and a lot of other things, none of which were true, but which I thought to be true at the time. And so I didn't encounter people. I didn't try to tell a lot of people. In fact, I tried very hard not to tell people and prayed that I would not be sick so, for a while so that people wouldn't find out. And then I would practice, you know, when you got sick, what were you going to say? And I was surrounded by, at that time, uh, persons living with AIDS who uh, were lying. 
uh, they had leukemia, they had cancer, and so forth. And it's a little easy to do that with AIDS because AIDS does not kill. It only, it only fixes your body where it invites something in that will. So you really don't die from AIDS. You do die from pneumonia or you, you do die from cancer. And so, as we all know, the physicians in the late 70s and early 80s very often would say the person died of cancer. Well, that's true, they did. But it was enhanced by the fact that they had uh, no immune system. So I, I, I would rehearse, you know, what am I going to say? Then I realized that I was, I realized that I was depriving myself of support. It's like, it's a poor analogy, but I'm going to make it anyway. Suppose I discovered a, a huge diamond out in my backyard. It's no fun to, to keep that to myself. I need to tell somebody. Well, I found this existence in my life of a, of a, a terminal disease. I need to tell somebody. I need, that's, that's big. That's big news. That's important. I need to share that. So I made those initial support calls, but I, I agonized over whom I would tell. And initially I, I, I told my uh, ex-wife, because we're very close. I told uh, people I worked with uh, in volunteer work with AIDS. I told people that I worked with as a teacher. And there were five. Among those five was one friend whom I deliberately and calculatedly said, I would like for this person to be my closest friend and to take care of me. So that when I feel like I don't want to give any responsibility to anyone, I don't want to do anything but just be taken care of, is there somebody I know and care for and who cares enough for me to, to say that they will do that and allow me to take care of them while I have strength and ability to do so, in a friendship kind of way. And so I asked this person, and it happens to be a woman. It's not easy to, for men and women to be friends in this culture, but we are. And very intimate uh, in terms of what you would expect friends to be. And uh, she was a part of the support group, as were four other people. It's very valuable. But I still was living in a type of conspiracy of silence. I don't think I looked at it that way. It wasn't a calculated thing other than one of protection. I did uh, talk to my children and told them what it was and tried to make them understand uh, what I was feeling and where I was and as best as I knew that, uh, what was my health status, so to speak, and where was I with them and so forth. And uh, I realized that that's not a one sitting situation, that you constantly communicate those things to your family. This is where I am today, and here's where I am now, and tomorrow I'll give you an update. You know? And uh, it becomes then a process rather than a one, oh, by the way, I'm terminal and I'll see you in eternity. It's not that cut and dried, it's a process uh, when you know that. You know, it's going to occur. Um, I realized it was okay for them to be a part of that process, that by virtue of our tie to one another, that they are a part of that process, and that I had, uh, I had only control over what I could tell them, then it was their ball to run with. And, uh, but I needed to give them information, or they couldn't function without that. I didn't want any surprises for them. Um, that, that made it, and I'm not going to count numbers, but that made it seven people who knew. And then I needed professionals who needed to know. Uh, I was worried about my job and I felt like that my bosses deserved to know. Because if the time bomb goes off and I'm in the middle of a semester or as a teacher, what are they going to do? And I had even and this is my judgment, I had an un unnatural, uh, it's not a good word, but it's my judgment, uh, preoccupation with, uh, I need to control that. You know, I need to take care of my, my job, and I need to take care of all of this, and I need to take care of that. It wasn't until later that I realized that, that, in fact, my boss told me when I talked with him about it that that's not my job. 
It's not my worry. But in the meantime, I then began to open a few more doors very carefully because I was getting professional advice from persons who had been working in the area with AIDS. Don't tell a lot of people. You'll be discriminated against. You'll be hurt. Uh, you could lose this. You could lose that. I have to say, I have yet to tell a person who has harmed me. I don't know whether that's rare or whether that is unusual. I know that I don't tell everybody that I'm not, uh, until this film, I'm not terribly open about this thing with everybody. But I know that one thing that brought me to the encounter to, to make this film, other than to really make this disease worth something, uh, was that uh, this lack of fear of being harmed in any way by people who know and discover or recognize who I am. I'd like to look at it, though, from not so much my point of view as from the point of view of others. And I watched persons, and I learned so much from this, I watched persons who I came to for support and realized that 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 is a mutual thing, and part of my living, as opposed to dying, was to also be supportive and to not play a passive role. So my support group is not my support group, we're, we're our support group. And uh, I view them as mine because I felt a need at the time, and then I realized that they also individually each need support, and that I, I can be a part of that. I don't have to be a passive person. I'm not dying uh, only. I am living as well, and living means action. And so I offer support. I put my arms around them. I hold them. I remember their birthdays. I, I take care of them when they're feeling badly. And that gives me value. It gives my life worthwhile. I wish I could say I knew that. I was taught that by them. And I, th I think that's very valuable. I have to share with, with, with you that I expected uh, persons to be patronizing, and I think halfway wanted them to be. Oh, you're dying, we won't do this, we'll tiptoe, and so forth. And then I would get angry when persons wouldn't do that. And part of my reaction to that was, well, they don't love me, or, or people don't really care, or they don't want to talk about it, so they're going to ignore it, or whatever. Then it occurred to me, they're behaving in exactly the way that you really want them to behave, if you'll think about that, because that means that, they're, that they are affirming the fact that you're living and not dying, and that's what you want. You want to be living on the day or the moment when you die, then, then let's all affirm that. But in the meantime, let's affirm the fact that you're living. Terminal or not, we're all terminal, as I said before. When I first, uh, even before I was diagnosed, I was a volunteer with AIDS Foundation as a counselor with persons who were living with AIDS. And once a week, I would meet with those persons and listen to them talk, facilitate their opportunity to share with one another. It's difficult for one to do that and not learn from that. No matter what your investment is in the thing, it's, you cannot help but learn from that. You're dealing with people who are in various stages and degrees of, of, uh, of devastation uh, to their body. And uh, because of that, watched several people, literally watched them uh, die with AIDS and uh, are a complication of that. But I also listened to them talk and learned from them. I had learned by training that I had received and observations and trips I'd made uh, to various conferences that in the, in the initial stages in the early 80s that, the, that the, the best thing we can provide for persons who are, are living with AIDS is to give them a support group of their peers, of other persons who are living with AIDS. Well, that, that same concept has been applied to other things, too. We put alcoholics together, we put drug abusers together in support of one another because they know the reality, each knows the reality of the other, and an outsider as a facilitator can do nothing more than that, really effectively, and that is except to facilitate. 
I was an outsider, I thought. I didn't know I hadn't been diagnosed. And when I was diagnosed, I was continuing to be a facilitator and becoming less and less of a facilitator and more and more of a participant to the extent that both inside and outside of a formal support group that met once a week are with friends who were terminal, whom I would talk to on the phone, for example, I begin to learn part of what I'm sharing, such as we all are uh, changing our priorities. We all are uh, encountering uh, uh, frustration. Uh, we all are, and this is a phenomenon that's probably not peculiar to this, but I found out about it through persons living with AIDS. Every time we get a hangnail, we all decide that the virus is doing us in. No matter what's wrong with you, uh, I remember my physician um, laughingly said, you know, people with AIDS do get colds, just like everybody else. It doesn't mean you're dying. Well, those of us with that, no matter where we are in that, you get a cold and that's it. You know, you're dying tomorrow because of, of that. You're expecting that along with So I got over that hump by talking with other people who were having the same things. Misery loves company? I don't know what the, the thing is there. What it means is that I realize I am not the only person experiencing this, that it is common. And once you know that everybody else relatively, is, has felt the same feeling and thought the same thoughts, then you feel, oh, okay, well then that's what happens. And there is a comfort in that. You are not losing your mind. You are not different. You are not in some way out of step. And we need to have the security of realizing that it's, that it's okay, whatever we're talking about, to be concerned, to be afraid, to be upset in some way. I have found phenomenally, and I say phenomenally because of what the literature and the newspapers included and other people have said who write about AIDS, I have encountered phenomenally an immense amount of support. And whether that comes from careful choosing of people whom I tell, I don't know. It may be. But I find that as the education about AIDS increases in this nation, that the persons who are supportive of it increase as well. Knowledge brings first tolerance, perhaps, and then compassion, perhaps, as well. I found in my own life that that was good because if it were any other disease that I was dying from, I wouldn't hesitate for a minute to tell everybody I walked in, in, into or I encountered. And I find it interesting that this particular kind of thing, much as cancer used to be, much as leprosy used to be, etc., is a private, quiet, secretive conspiracy. Conspiracy against the individual who has it. So I'm pleased that I've reached a point in my life where I feel comfortable with who does and does not know and realize that there's no need to tell everybody any more than you would tell everybody everything else about your life and that there is some value in telling certain persons who may be helpful to you but I have since then found it more importantly to tell persons because it may be helpful to them. And that came much later. I got me taken care of at a time in, uh, and in a, a culture where perhaps we're too much of an I culture. I'm not, an accus I'm not making an accusation, just an observation. Then I finally realized there were people who could benefit from knowing this, not because of anything I could provide, but that uh, they would know they're not alone or they would realize that, uh, that uh, I, uh, they could learn something uh, in some way benefit from knowing that, not just I. Um, I strongly believe that there is a value in persons of similar crisis to be together, to share with one another and support one another. I don't care what it is. It doesn't make any difference what it is. I find that that's valuable.
part of my support group and part of the support group available for any human being uh, are, are a collection of professionals in the, in the health field, our fields. Nurses, physicians uh, of various types, um, counselors, uh, a large number of people who do what would appear to be mundane things are very, very necessary. The, uh, the, the young lady who draws my blood, the uh, respiratory therapist who, who deals with uh, some medication to prevent uh, pneumonia, whatever the situation, all of these people are part of the team. Until I was diagnosed, I believed that patients, clients, are passive. That you go to the hospital and you lie down and let people take care of you. That you go to the doctor, tell him or her what is, what is bothering you, and then wait for a cure, whatever. I since then in my study of AIDS and then in my own life realized that I am a part of the healing team, that I am a healer also, that I am imbued with a, as a creation of God with certain abilities by virtue of being human to cure and that everyone has these. That even though I am not a pharmacologist, that I am not a psychotherapist, that I am not a surgeon, that I am not a, a nurse, I am nevertheless part of the team. And that I, therefore, need to take the responsibility for my own life and use these people, and the word use, deliberately chosen, in the way in which they offer themselves. Therefore, I make my own appointments, I take my own medication, I give myself my own medication, more often than not. Meaning, uh, when I need a shot, I give it to myself. I, I don't know that everybody can always do that, but in this case, it, uh, the chemotherapy is easier done that way. I take the responsibility for making sure I have the blood test regularly and don't leave it to my physician or, or in this case, his nursing staff to remind me of that. To me, that provides not only control over my life as much as I can, but it also, I think, is the responsible thing for us all to do, whether we're terminal or not, immediately. That, in the end, I need to be responsible for that and to make decisions about that and to take care of that kind of thing. I have found, for that reason, that the professionals in my life, many of whom are also friends, but the professionals in my life find it a lot easier to take care of me than if I were totally a passive individual in that respect and saying, here I am, I've presented my body, now you heal me along the way. Not only is that attitudinally effective, but I think it's, it's literally medically effective that I make sure that I eat correctly and I terminated a lot of practices in my life, such as smoking and drinking and so forth, not for moral reasons, but for health reasons. And I, and I made those decisions based on that. This is a healthy thing to do. I need to, I need to take over and uh, get involved with the healing process, both attitudinally and physically, literally, along the way. So I watch my food, I watch my diet, I, I watch my uh, uh, atmosphere, I take care of myself by choice along with these professional consultants in my life. Um, I learned that from reading. Someone in a book suggested that's what we ought to do, and so I can't take full credit for that. I wish I could, but I can't. But I, th I, I really hold it up as something exceptionally worthwhile. What else do I need to talk about? That's all I can think of right now. Did you want to cover about you? The only other thing you're talking about is your um, relationships to hunger. Relationships to what? Oh, yes, 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 yes. <coughs> I was talking about loss well, uh, not too long ago. I think uh, what I would have expected had I been told five years ago that uh, you're going to find five years from now that you're terminal, and I would expect, oh gosh, what I'm going to miss is the loss of life and, and health. 
And certainly that does cross your mind. But I find that what I really miss more than anything else is, is not so much a loss by virtue of, of, a, of a, some sort of tiny microcosm, but rather a loss that is strangely enough self-imposed, and that is a, a loss of intimacy because of the nature of this, I choose not to be intimate. Uh, part of that I wish I could say is uh, that it's totally unselfish that I don't wish to offer uh, infection to someone else, certainly, or, or used goods or, or damaged goods or whatever one wants to say dramatically. But part of it also is, is an ego kind of thing. I am not willing to take the time and energy that one offers by choice to another individual in an intimate relationship. And yet, I find that because I have chosen not to offer all of that to one person, I offer it to many. And what I don't receive from a, by choice from one person, generally I can receive from many. And I'm speaking, of course, about psychological kinds of things and, and spiritual kinds of things. What do I miss the most? I'm, I, I've found in other people, and it certainly is true in my case, I miss being held sometimes and being passive. And uh, I don't have to be the father, I don't have to be the teacher, I don't have to uh, be the leader, I can be passive and, and you hold me. And I think that's one thing we offer to people. So every once in a while, <laughs> I kind of frighten my friends and say, would you just hold me for a minute? And, and uh, they always do. And now they're, I guess they're getting used to it. But uh, it, allows me, it, it allows me a true feeling and not a manufactured, superficial kind of thing. It's, I know that they really care for me, they're my friends, and when they hold me, they really mean it. So I get what I need from that kind of thing. Uh, I missed, and that's in the past tense, sharing on a daily basis. With, an, in, with a significant other. You know, this is what I did today, this is what I felt today, this is what I, and how are you? What are you feeling today, and what is your pain, and, and what can I do for you? I miss that, the interaction between with another person. And then I realized, I, once again, that I could give and take that from friends as well. So I had a larger number of people then, not, not an extensive amount, but a larger number of people with whom I uh, gave, uh, gave and, and took as if it were just one other person in my life. Can many people replace one? No. But I've made choices, and I'm comfortable with those choices, and I find that um, on one hand the uh, responsibility of an intimate relationship uh, is something I don't want to deal with right now. Uh, the stress or whatever the situation may be that is normal to that kind of thing. <clears throat> I believe, I guess what I am saying, that we all should encounter that. Deliberately choose. What do you want in your life, in a relationship? And then, for those of us who are, who are compromised in our lives by ill health, really owe it to ourselves, I think, to ask that question. That's a part of your life as a human being. The need to belong and to love and be loved is significant. What are you going to do about that? And very often, I, and I mention that because very often in the early stages of, of our dealing with persons living with AIDS, that was considered to be something that automatically was abandoned. And then we begin to learn very quickly, and I use the word we generically there, we begin to learn very quickly that uh, persons can't so readily abandon that, that that's part of being human, and that we need to encounter that kind of thing. My sons and I hold each other more. Part of that is a realization of where I'm going to be and you know, whenever. But, all, but it's great. Uh, my friends and I look at each other differently. And it's a mutual kind of thing. It's, it's not a passive thing where I'm, you know, I'm dying, take care of me kind of business. Uh, I guess also what I'm saying is that loss 
in through the understanding that you're going to die sometimes can be avoided by contemplation and by that I mean encountering what you're feeling, looking at what you're feeling, and trying to, if you can, find out what are, what are the options for you. And if you can't, get someone else to help you find out and realize what those options are. And then choose life and choose, uh, and choose to take care of those that, you're, that perhaps you're not. So um, I lost intimacy. That was, that was my loss by choice but gained it in, an, in another way. Because uh, I wish I could say I did, other people helped me to realize the options in my life. And, and uh, sick or not, we all probably ought to deal with that, look at that, you know, what are the options in your life. And I find uh, very comfortable with where I am. Immensely comfortable where I am. Can we stop? Yeah, yeah. I'm tired. Mm. Your cat wants to get in. Oh, yeah.